Castillo, Dr. Peter Flint, Professor of Religious Studies and Co-Director of the Dead Sea Scrolls Institute at Trinity Western University in British Columbia. Dr. Flint received his PhD from the University of Notre Dame, home of the Fighting Irish. <laughs> Dr. Flint has authored the groundbreaking The Dead Sea Psalm Scrolls and the Book of Psalms, and co-authored with James Vanderkam the popular The Meaning of the Dead Sea Scrolls. He has also edited or co-edited several other learned books, including the massive two-volume work, The Dead Sea Scrolls After 50 Years, A Comprehensive Assessment. Besides several books, Dr. Flint is a contributor to the Discoveries in the Judean Desert series. <coughs> and has published dozens of articles and reviews in learner journals and encyclopedias. He is also a popular conference speaker, and his paper today is titled, The Dead Sea Scrolls and the Biblical Canon. Professor Flint, welcome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, with after such a, a great introduction, it's very hard to live up with that you should have rather just said, this is some guy, we, we're not expecting much. <laughs> um, I just have to turn on the mic, so there we are. Um, folks, uh, thank you very much. It's great to be at Acadia. Uh, we've been very impressed by the organization, the hospitality, the kindness, and you've got something real good going here. So we, we thank you very much. It's, uh, it's just good to be here. Now, almost ready with the mic. Let's just see. Yeah. Quiet for sound. Yeah. Testing. Hello, testing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, uh, we, we guys, we use Macintosh. We're just simple. <laughs> Battery's gone. Okay. Don't worry, folks. Um, How's that? There we are. I think I'm getting an extra two minutes. Folks, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to go rather fast. We're going to be talking about questions of canon and the Bible and the biblical scrolls and, uh, and what the scrolls have to say about the canon. Much of what I say today will be familiar to some, but some of it will be, has a different twist. So I, I hope you will find that. I thought I would begin with just a few slides on the biblical scrolls. So, uh, could we have the slides, is this, do you want some lights down, is that, is that possible? Uh, let's just take a quick journey to Qumran, just for a few minutes, a journey some of you in this room have taken before, from the holy city of Jerusalem to a place called Qumran. Next one, please. Um, as we take that journey, we come to an amazing uh, um, marker in the middle of the desert, sea level. Uh, I think of that, it's rather amazing really, we're not going to sea level, we are in fact going to the lowest spot on the face of this earth, the Dead Sea, 1300 feet below the level of the sea. Isn't that amazing? So we're going, next please. We're going to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea, seven times saltier than the oceans of the world. Nothing lives there except microscopic organisms. But our interest, of course, is the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, here's something a lot of people do not know, is that uh, the scrolls are mainly found at Qumran, but they actually refer to sites down the western coast of the Dead Sea. The scrolls are found in Murabaat, Nafal Kheba, Masada. And that's, that's something that's it's quite interesting. Uh, there's a lot of um, non-Qumranic Dead Sea Scrolls. Next. The story is very famous. I will not detain you. 1947, a shepherd boy throws a stone into a cave and he heard, hears the sound of breaking pottery. And little did he know it, but this shepherd boy was to make the greatest find of our time, the Dead Sea Scrolls. There he is on the right as an older man, Muhammad the Wolf. Another bit of new knowledge, recent knowledge, he was interviewed recently and Muhammad says, you know, I think we got it wrong. I think it was 1946. So if you say in your exam, students, 1946, 
you're not wrong. In fact, you're being smart. He, he said that. So, uh, it may be the date. Go on, please. Now, he took the first scrolls to, to this man, Kendo, an antiquities dealer. And, and Kendo belonged to the Syrian Orthodox Church. So, please notice that the scrolls were found by Muslims. They were passed on into Christian hands. And, and you'll see where I'm going with this in just a moment. They ended up with this man, the Archbishop Samuel. And he decided, what could he do with them, really? He would like to sell them to get money for his church. That's not dishonorable, I would think. He's not trying to get rich himself and, and uh, you know, have a scandal. He wanted to raise funds for the church. And quite frankly, if you were given a Dead Sea Scroll, you'd do the same thing. Because what do you do with it? It's so valuable, so precious, so fragile. They belong in the museum. And so he decided to raise money for his church. And you know... Very well, if you want to raise money, where do you go? Next slide. You go to America, of course. And he put in this ad. This is an actual historic ad in the Wall Street Journal of all places. The four Dead Sea Scrolls for sale. An ideal gift to an educational or religious institution <laughs> by an individual or group. As I said to my wife, who, who uh, um, works, she, she's an accountant at the university, uh, professor in, in business, I said, hey, why should, why should the Bible guys have all the fun? The Wall Street Journal can have some fun too. You see that? Folks, uh, the bishop asked $1 million US. Now, that's back in the 60s. Oh, that's a lot of money. On we go, please. Now, there's a third group interested in the scrolls, the Muslims and the Jews. And, sorry, the Muslims and the Christians. And, and, of course, the Israelis, the Jews. Here we see the famous gen general, Yigal Yadin. He be believed that the scrolls were destined to be part of, of, of Jewish... Uh, they, they, they belonged to Israel. He wanted to get them back for the state of Israel. In fact, there's an amazing story. His father, his, his father Professor Sukhanik, managed to purchase the first Dead Sea Scrolls for the Hebrew University on the very day that Israel was declared a state by the United Nations. There's a destiny. There's, a, uh, there, there, there's something for Jews... The scrolls are not just ancient documents. Here were, here were materials written when the second temple was still standing. This was part of where Jews were coming from. For Jews, the scrolls are a symbol of their identity. Now, I say all this. The scrolls were found by Muslims. Um, they were received by Christians, purchased by Jews, because the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, a lot of people ask me, who do they belong to? And, and of course, it's very political. But you know, uh, last year I was in Texas. And do you know the Texans like to talk, think big, right? You know that, right? I was in Texas and I said, I said, hey, at Baylor University, I said, guys, the question is this. It's not are the scrolls big enough for Texas. The question is, is Texas big enough for the scrolls? <laughs> they like that. Yeah, they like that. Yeah, no, they like it when you think big there, you see. So, my point is the scrolls are too big for one group. They belong to us all. That's an important question, because even the scrolls have been politicized. Next one, please. Now, folks, uh, that was cave one. Cave four is where most of the scrolls were found. You descend very precipitously. You descend vertically down through the chimney. Vertically. There you see Martin Abegg. <laughs> Doctor, going down like for 17 feet, you can break your neck. And this is what it looks like today. Cave number four. In this one cave were found over 500 manuscripts. Here was the mother load. Here was the treasure trove. Uh, um, the oldest Bible text in the world. The oldest non-Bible text. Going back to, to, to um, over 250 BC, the new carbon 14 testing dates. They say even older than 250 BC. Amazing. They were so old that even scholars could not believe them. Um, the Israelis built a, this famous museum, the Shrine of the Book. There you see a, 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 a white roof and a black granite slab, symbolizing the eternal struggle between light and darkness, good and evil. Uh, if you look at the roof, it's rather stylistic deliberately designed to imitate one of the jars. Do you see that? A designer roof, to use Martha Stewart language. <laughs> right, okay, on we go. On we go. 
Now, folks, most of the Dead Sea Scrolls, over 90%, are not kept there. They have been kept um, until just recently in this, bo- in this uh, building, the Rockefeller Museum in East Jerusalem. Um, deep underground, in, in, in a climate-controlled area, bomb-proof, I'm told, this is where most of the scrolls have been kept. You descend down the oldest, uh, on the oldest elevator in Israel, down into the bowels of the Rockefeller Museum. This is the place where the public cannot go. This is where the editors of the scrolls do most of our work. Here we go. In this small room, this is actually quite an important picture. I cannot unpack it for you now, but there is the famous card catalogue that Dr. Abig knows all too well. In, in these drawers are kept uh, some 90% of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you can see very quickly why the public cannot have access. It's too cramped and too, it's, it's too uh, delicate an environment. On we go. Now, m- what about the Bible scrolls? I mean, talk about canon today. Well, you know, when you look at that picture, it looks pretty miserable. One man said, these are not the Dead Sea Scrolls. These are the Dead Sea Scraps. <laughs> but you know something, folks? Sometimes, sometimes um, in these tiny battered scraps, um, are found the stuff that dreams are made of. You know, sometimes a small thing can have great power. Let me just give you an example. You guys, the next time Valentine's Day comes around, instead of buying her a new SUV, buy her one red rose, and you'll find there's more power, ladies, in that one red rose than in a new SUV. You get it? Uh, what, uh, 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 I don't think the guys get it. <laughs> I know of a story. Uh, I remember this. It was the lady's birthday, and he bought her. I think he bought her a. Um, it, it, it was it was it was a car or something, and she got so mad. She said, couldn't you just buy me one dozen roses? So, but sometimes, um, you know, in these battered fragments are unlocked wonderful secrets, and we'll be looking at some of them today. Next one, please. Um, we're going to talk about the Bible scrolls, and I, I'm, I'm being very brief. I could go on for a long time. This is not one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is the standard Bible used by just about everybody today. Um, this is the oldest copy of the Bible in the world, the Hebrew Bible, the oldest complete Bible that is used by scholars and students all over the world today. Now, some of you who've done Hebrew might say, well, I haven't seen that. This is the Leningrad Codex, kept in Russia, about 1000 AD, on we go. You haven't seen that, but this is what you have seen. Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, the printed version of the Leningrad Codex. What is shocking for some is to discover that this is not even a thousand years old. Uh, most Christians and Jews would say, I believe my Bible really does go back much earlier. But until the scrolls, we had virtually nothing in Hebrew that was much earlier than this. It's like having all your editions of Shakespeare dated in the 20th century. And you get these guys saying, well, I, I really believe he wrote the stuff in 1600, you, you know, but it's, it was tricky. We, you know, we didn't have anything ancient in Hebrew. On we go, please. But now, look at this. Here we have the great Isaiah scroll going back to the first century B.C. Not uh, 1,000, not 2,000, but 2,100 years old. Next one, please. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We talked about the, the uh, servant song today. Folks, this is amazing stuff. They are so old that learned scholars were writing articles on how the scrolls must be medieval. They could not believe they were B.C. Yeah, maybe 800 A.D., maybe 700. But please, B.C., give me a break. And yet now we know they really are that ancient. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the Bible Scrolls, and of course the non-Bible Scrolls, which I won't talk about today. Now, let me be fair, some of them are pretty battered. Here's a bit of Samuel. And yet, even in these battered fragments, um, are preserved the oldest readings. And, and they have the effect of confirming, on the one hand, the accuracy of your Bible. And yet, they also bring us a lot of new readings, which show that the, de- the text grew and, was, and developed. Next one, please. Uh, this is a fascinating picture. Uh, this is the end of the great psalm scroll from Qumran. Now, you may wonder, uh, why do we have the, the arrows? Well, first of all, that's the end of the psalm, psalm, and there's a blank column. But those tiny arrows point to holes 
which trace the trajectory of a tiny worm as he burrowed his way through the scroll. And even, even those holes are useful because you can line them up to figure out exactly how the scroll was rolled up originally. Even a tiny worm has his uses. On we go, please. Folks, just a couple of personal things. Uh, um, sorry to show you myself, but I had, uh, it's, it's in the museum. There's no other way I could show you this. As a student, um, um, I decided to study the Psalms, and uh, there, I ha- there I am holding in my hands the oldest psalm scroll in the whole world. You, you, you know, it's quite a humbling experience, if you're interested in anything, is, is to have the, the first one, or the oldest one. I was asked by the Vancouver uh, Sun, you know where that is, that other part of the country, uh, the Vancouver Sun, uh, um, I was asked, what was it like to hold in your hands the psalm scroll? And I said it was like having Wayne Gretzky's first hockey stick signed. Eh? Uh, you get it, right? Does that get through to you? Okay. In Texas, I, in Texas, I got in use football, and you, you know, etc. Okay. Now, folks, um, just, just a little bit more um, um, about the Psalm scrolls. Uh, here is another scroll. Uh, this was holding up the edition of the, of the DJD for, for Oxford. It was holding it up. I, I know I'm, I'm not going to talk long if you worry. I'm not, okay. Um, folks, uh, the, this, this Psalm scroll was holding up was holding up the, the edition. Uh, we, we, you see, part of our job is not only to make uh, um, printed copies from photographs, we have to study the originals. And uh, Professor Ulrich and I were quite frantic. Uh, the psalm, this psalm scroll could not be found. It was not in Israel. What do you do? Where do you find it? How, so I c- called Professor Torv. I said, Professor Torv, we've got to find the psalm scroll. We've got to check the thickness, check the leather, do the leather description. We, he says, we don't know where it is. Professor Ulrich didn't know where it was. So what do you do when you can't find a psalm scroll? Well, it turns out there was one last resort. There was an old scholar called Professor Millick, who was known as the fastest man with a scroll, who'd retired to Paris. And I was told, if anybody knows where it is, Professor Millick would, do, would know. And so, uh, don't you feel sorry for me? I had to go to Paris. <laughs> well, hey, someone had to do it, right? Okay, on we go, please. And uh, here I... Uh, and, and, and there I came to Paris, I met with Professor Millick, and he said, you're in luck. Did you know that the psalm scroll, the, the one that I showed you, 4Q, Psalms Q, uh, was actually in Paris, and it turned out that back in the 60s, one of the original editors of the scrolls, Professor Starkey, had made a small museum in the heart of Paris, unbeknown to most people. And Professor Millick picked up the phone, and the curator most graciously opened up, and he let me in, and there you can see the pottery, this tiny little museum in the heart of Paris, and uh, we come to the end of the quest, the end of the journey. There it is, the missing psalm scroll. Now, folks, uh, this is a little, bit, a little bit of inside knowledge, but, you know, next time the professor says, well, the scrolls are in Israel, you say, Professor, did you know there's one scroll in Paris? It's, it's sort of cute, isn't it? It's not known. It's not known. So, um, I think that's the end of our Bible scrolls. Let's just... Uh, uh, Oh, just one last thing, one last thing. Folks, um, um, we have to think of Bible, not according to our Bible, but according to what was Scripture for them. And uh, there's a new new discovery being made. There's been some Greek scrolls from cave number 7 at Qumran, and everybody was wondering what they were. Were they they Septuagint? Were they New Testament? People were claiming they were Mark. Well, just recently, the, the mystery of the Greek scrolls has been cracked. It's now been a, d- determined that many of the Greek scrolls from Cave 7 are not actually from the New Testament or the Greek Bible, but they're actually from the book of Enoch. Isn't that interesting? And every time I, I, I give a lecture and I mention the book of Enoch, there's always two or three people who come up to me afterwards and they sort of look a little suspicious. Dr. Flint, I, I know, almost like they're talking underground as if they were spies. Like, Dr. Flint, you know about that book? There's some devotees of Enoch. I think they're like New Ages or something. I always meet a few. Probably in this room, there's somebody who says, I've got to talk to Dr. Flint afterwards. But they're almost like act guilty. Uh, it's, a strange, it's a very strange book. Uh, and and uh, it, was, it was actually banned by the church quite quickly. It's, it talks about angels and devils and demons. But uh, 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 Enoch was one of the most popular books at Qumran. And I will show you in the handout, they actually regarded it as scripture. Last one, please. And they're not alone. The book of Jude quotes from the book of Enoch 
as scripture. Isn't that interesting? Do you know that? And hey, it's not my fault, okay? <laughs> In case you worry. <laughs> okay, let, let's uh, stop there and turn to the uh, handout. I've got, what, I've got like 10 minutes. Sure. Yeah. Well, hey, we did start 10 minutes late. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Okay. Very good, folks. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the scrolls and the canon of the Hebrew Bible. And the professor's already are saying, oh boy, look at that title. And he's got it all wrong. So let me just start by saying this. The term canon is not easily understood for three reasons. Number one, it's a technical term. Um, it, 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 it's, uh, um, canon is a technical term. Uh, number two, excuse me just a moment, the different groups have different canons. In this very room, there are different canons. You know, I was once in Israel, and a person came up to me and said, are you studying New Testament or Bible? You, you see? So, so, so the, we have different canons. Uh, he, that, they weren't being facetious. See, for Jews, the canon would be the, the Hebrew Bible. Christians would have the New Testament as well. So even the, what's in the canon is, is very different to different groups. And uh, uh, you'll actually also find in the Old Testament that the, the Catholics and the Protestants and other groups, we have different canons. So it's not, it's, it means different things to different people. And also, uh, we, we like to define earlier traditions in terms of what we know. So, so in this room, most of you would be Protestant. You would perhaps automatically say, well, it's quite easy. The Catholics added to the Old Testament, right? The Apocrypha? The Catholics added. They sort of cheated. But now if you were a Catholic seminary, you'd say, well, the Protestants left out some of the scriptures. You, you get it? Uh, and so we have to be very careful in defining the word canon. Now, most scholars now agree that the canons of Jews, Protestants, and Catholics come from ancient evidence. Look at the definition I came up with. A canon is the closed list of books that was accepted retrospectively by community as supremely authoritative and binding for religious practice and doctrine. That's what a canon is. And the idea is if you're a Protestant or a Catholic or a Jew, this can work for you, right? God's word is the canon. Well, fine, depends what church you're in. Like a Jew would agree with you and so would a Catholic, but they actually would have slightly different Bibles. So um, um, it seems rather than using the word canon and Bible, the best terminology is scripture. Uh, scripture would be the best. You know, when Martin Abig and I did the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, we didn't really want to use the word Bible because it means a completed book. We, we have it up there, the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, but uh, the publisher said, well, you've got to have the word Bible, otherwise it won't sell. But, but you, you see, so scri Scripture probably would be better, the Dead Sea Scrolls Scripture. Now, Scripture means a writing that was considered divinely re revealed, uniquely authoritative, and believed to be ancient. Now, folks, we need to say that um, because, uh, um, in a sense, the church and other groups believe that all of our, our works are, are, are um, it, uh, um, sorry, uh, inspired. Uh, just let me give you an example from, from Qumran. The Habakkuk Pesha, the commentary in Habakkuk. Um, this is what it says there. <clears throat> I will stand on watch and station myself on my watchtower. I will wait for what God will say to me and I'll reply to his rebuke. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write down the vision on tablets so that with ease someone may read it. So he's quoting from Habakkuk chapter 6. Um, and then he says, This refers to God told Habakkuk to write down what was going to happen to the generation to come. The bottom line is that the Pesharim, they quote scripture and then they give you the divinely inspired interpretation. But there's a distinction. Scripture would be the ancient authoritative text. And although the interpretation was also inspired, it's different, right? It's like you're, you have scripture and you may believe John Calvin or Martin Luther have God's word, God's interpretation, but it's not the same. So although at Qumran they believe much of their writings were inspired, by scripture we mean what was perceived as ancient uh, Bible, if you like. And, so, and we need to make that distinction. Um, I, I go on. So, so, so uh, we have the scriptural text and the interpretation. I'd like to, to refer you to the next page, uh, to, the, to, the, to the, um, the table. And this should be easy for most of you in this room. 
when we talk about the Old Testament, uh, we have different ones. We have the Jewish, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox. And uh, depending on what church you're from, you actually, that would be your, your, your Bible, right? And they, they, they are a bit different. Page, this is page two of the handout. Okay? Um, folks, I'd just like to say, uh, if you go back, if you go, if you go back to the first page, that even the Jewish um, Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible is not as simple as it looks because, because uh, one scholar has pointed out that, that the books that I've listed there on page one in the middle are not the same as the standard Jewish Bible. In some traditions, for instance, um, you've got the five scrolls making up one book. You have one chronicles making up another book, two chronicles making up another book. So even in some Jewish Bibles, the, the configuration is not the same. So, so the idea is that the word canon of the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible is, is, is a complicated thing and it's, 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 it's far more diverse than we're led to believe. Um, I'd like to talk about the structure of, of, of these canons. By what that scholar was Jack Lightstone. If I talk about the structure of the canon, please notice that the Jewish canon ends with Ezra and Nehemiah Chronicles. And you all know what's happening there, right? The Jews are returning to the Promised Land. That is the culmination of the Hebrew Bible. Okay? Christian canon ends with the Minor Prophets, Malachi. That is to do with the end times and the coming of Messiah. So the idea is that the Christian canon, the Old Testament, ends with the expectation of Messiah. My point is, Hebrew Bible and Old Testament are not the same thing. Okay? So what do we call it? Jim Sanders suggests First Testament, but Hebrew Bible and Old Testament are two different things. So what, what, what do we study at university? Uh, Hebrew Bible, we don't only study Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's... I don't really, so this is why I say Hebrew Bible slash um, Old Testament. <coughs> okay, um, <coughs> I have so little time to do this. Uh, let me go on, I've got, to, I've got to move on to Qumran. So folks, we have different Bibles, there's the point so far. Um, what, about the, what about the ancient evidence for these Bibles? I have on page 3 a number of quotations. I'd just like to read you a couple of them. If you look at the first one, the prologue to, ben, to, to Sirach, about 132 BC, the grandson of, of Ben Sirach translated his book into Greek. And here's what he says in his prologue. Many great teachings have been given to us through the law and the prophets and the others that followed them. If you go down a, a few lines, the law and the prophets and the other books of our ancestors. And at the end, the law, the prophecies, the rest of the books. If I go to number C from Maccabees, the books about the kings, the prophets, the writings of David, the letters of kings about votive offerings. I go down to Ezra, 4th Ezra, the 24 books you wrote um, and, the, and the, the 70 other books. What I'm trying to get to is what did the ancient people say about the Old Testament slash Hebrew Bible? Uh, we go down to 4 Maccabees, the law and the prophets. And when he talks about the law and the prophets, he mentions Daniel, Isaiah, the psalmist David, Proverbs, and Ezekiel. Do you see what's happening here? If he's talking about the prophets, we've got David and Proverbs in there. We go down to Philo, who talks about laws, oracles, delivered through the mouth of prophets, psalms, and anything else which fosters perfect knowledge. Over the page, a famous passage, Josephus. He talks about the five books of Moses, the prophets, uh, in 13 books, and then the, the remaining four books. And, and a lot of people said, oh, that's very easy. You see, there's our Hebrew Bible, as on page 2. Well, actually, there's been a number of, of attempts to find out what are those 13 prophets. First of all, we have Sinjin, Thackeray. He lists them as, as you see, Joshua down to tw the 12. Roger Beckwith, Joshua down to the 12. James Vanderkamp, and they're all different. So, folks, even Josephus' 13 prophets are not so simple. He also talks about the remaining four books. Again, uh, you can see uh, Thackeray, Beckwith, and Van der Kamp. So, so, what's emerging so far is that at the, around about the time of Jesus, Jews had this idea of a law and the prophets and other books. The New Testament, we're on page number 5. Um, um, Jesus says in Luke 24, What's written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. You, um, I, I think what's, 
what's happening to assess all this, outside Qumran, we have several series of scriptures. Um, the first group is called the Law, or the Law of Moses, or the Books of Moses. Second one is the Prophets, the Prophecies, etc. Then you have additional books. There's, there seems to be an additional grouping of books um, if you look at the evidence outside Qumran. So folks, uh, uh, I think it's pretty clear when you put all that together. Now what about Qumran itself? Uh, I have a number of quotations from the scrolls which talk about Moses and the prophets. But it seems to me, and as we'll see what books were regarded as scripture, that at Qumran there were other books which would not qualify as prophets that were scripture. And so we have this controversial passage from MMT that talks about Moses, the prophets, and David, and the events of ages past. Professor Ulrich has said that this is textually suspicious and it doesn't fit. But you know, uh, the, it, it, it may be true because there's more than just the Moses and the prophets uh, as, as, as regards scripture. In fact, that is suggesting four groupings. Moses, the prophets, David, and the events of ages past. Um, and it, it may have some uh, correlation at the bottom of page 5 with Maccabees, kings, prophets, David, and votive offerings. You can see I've been going very fast. Uh, let, let me get to the climax of it all. Uh, you know, what, what, are the, what, what, what did the people of Qumran regard as scripture? What I've done so far is I had to put it in context because you can't just look at the scrolls by themselves. Um, We've got to look at the wider context. Uh, basically, folks, if you want to say what did they regard as scripture, you can't just look at our Bible and say that was their Bible. We first have to look at statements that indicate scriptural status. For instance, Damascus document, as God promised them by Ezekiel. Number B, appeal to prophecy. These he composed through prophecy. Number C, divine authority. The idea is, if someone quotes something as scripture, then they regard it as scripture. Claims of authority. Um, so you've got uh, examples of Enoch, Jubilees, where they are claiming to have God's authority. Davidic superscription, Psalm 151, which ends the Septuagint. It says um, it's, it's by David. You see? So these all are indications of prophetic sta of scriptural status. What about the manuscripts preserved? How I wish I'd had time to unpack this, but the most popular books. Psalms, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, Genesis, Exodus, Jubilees, Leviticus and Enoch. We come down to page 7. Translation in Greek or Aramaic. You know, a book was scripture if they were translated into Greek or Aramaic. They didn't do the opposite. The Pesharim, if they quote scripture and then comment on it, that shows you that the book quoted means scripture. Do you see, we have to rid ourselves by saying, well, I'll take my King James Bible and I'll see uh, what they thought. We're saying, if you, if you start without anything, what indicates what was scripture? And this is how we do it. Well, folks, uh, let's come to the end. Um, if you want to get uh, dependence on other books, you have to f uh, first isolate the Qumranic writings, such as the Manual of Discipline, the Damascus Document. If you look at all the quotations of books, go to the final page, and here really is a summary of everything I'm saying. A little bit complicated. Um, I've divided the books into three groups. First of all, the books associated with Moses. Do you see that? Everybody with me? Okay, using their categories. You've got Genesis to Deuteronomy, and I know you would say, duh, I mean, but look there, the manuscripts involved, um, and also they are used in the Quranic, the sectarian works. Do you see that? And so we can say it's certain that Genesis to Deuteronomy are scripture. By the way, were they, were they together? Uh, several of the, of the scrolls, the Pentateuch scrolls, continue with the next book. Uh, we have, for example, uh, I think it's one of the, 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 the uh, number scrolls continues with Leviticus. One of the Genesis scrolls continues with Exodus. It seems pretty certain that they were a unit. Genesis down to Deuteronomy was a unit uh, at, at Qumran. They were combined. Another one is reworked Pentateuch. Now that, uh, um, that could be a different edition of the Pentateuch. And uh, um, I, I put certain, bec um, uh, we haven't said used in distinctive works, but maybe many of the quotations of the Pentateuch could equally be from reworked Pentateuch. So this reworked Pentateuch um, has, uh, I think, is, uh, is scripture. 
And uh, the same works for the temple scroll. Now you see, uh, in, in the early edition of, of the book, The Meaning of the Scrolls, I put possible for both of them. Now I put certain for both of them and I got a, I got a text in a, in a review. But, so now I sort of backed a bit, I got a bit chicken. So I put Pentateuch as certain and temple scroll as possible. So those really are in the certain or possible category, especially if we can get quotations of them in another work. They, but I think the books of Moses goes down, it's not just the Pentateuch. Let's go on. What about the prophets? And you see what I've done? We have um, the number of manuscripts and, and where they are quoted. The idea is if they're not quoted by somebody at, at Qumran, they may not have been scripture. And we have the normal um, um, uh, collection, but notice Enoch is there. Enoch was one of their most scriptural works. They loved the book of Enoch. Okay, the letter of Jeremiah is your possible exception, found in Cave 7. And what about David and the other books? Now, you see what I've called it, David and the other books. And even if Professor Ulrich uh, was here today and he says this David thing doesn't work, there must have been another category. I don't think you could put these others all into prophets. And the Psalms, of course, is a shoe in right? Proverbs, Job. Now, folks, look at this. Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, Ben Sira. These are iffy at Qumran. Two manuscripts, or four, but they don't seem to be quoted. Now, maybe we'll find a quotation with Dr. Abig's concordance, but, but, but you see, songs, Ecclesiastes, and Ben Sira are pretty iffy. Joshua and Judges, there's more testimony for them. Ruth, um, Ruth is also possible. Samuel is, is, is a certain. Chronicles is pretty iffy. We have, we have just... Um, one miserable little scrap of Chronicles of Qumran. Um, I was just thinking, John, of Pseudo Daniel, maybe that guy was using the Chronicles listing of priests and kings. Maybe that would be a way of saying, hey, maybe there was influence of Chronicles on, on the Pseudo Daniel, uh, but maybe was it was it for the Chronicles? But folks, do you see what, I, what you're saying? If we only have one or two manuscripts of a book and it's not quoted, maybe it wasn't scripture Qumran. Okay, and then we go on. Um, Esther was, was out. They did not like Esther because of the calendar of the uh, Purim festival in Esther. First, um, there is a summary of the latest research in my, uh, uh, from me on, on all this. And uh, some of you may be a bit worried about the third category. Here's the bottom line. The Hebrew Bible is only finished, say, in the 2nd century AD, when the rabbis finally decide what is in or out. We even know that the rabbis were fighting about some of these books like Song of Songs and Esther as late as the end of the first century AD. So um, I think this shows you the new research. A lot of us in this room were, were brought up to believe, well, the Old Testament was done by the time of Jesus or 200 BC, right? Well, a lot of it was done, but the third category is still being finalized. And I think for, 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 for our close with this, if you want a message from all this, it's that we had all these scriptures out there, but that without the church, you don't have a Bible. The idea is that the, the idea of finalizing these scriptures into a book by the rabbis or the church fathers, you had to have that step before you had your final canon. You get it? You had the inspired scriptures, if you like, but to finalize the collection was done later, and so you don't have your Bible without the church or without the rabbis to to finalize it. Is it time for questions? Yes. Canon, Bible, anything you like. Some of this may be disturbing to some of you, uh, especially on that last section, but that's the evidence from Corporate. Uh, it's kind of important to ask the doctor and Tom this question too. But is there, is there a possibility that there would be a book added to or removed <coughs> from our current canon? Question is, would there be a book added to the canon? Um, I think the answer is no. The idea is the canon is closed. If they were to find a writing of Paul or, or the book of Jasher or something mentioned in the Old Testament, it's still closed. If they find another gospel with Jesus saying, no, it's still closed. Uh, you might form another church to make a new canon, but, but, but if you're a Christian or a Jew, as far as I know, the canon is pretty much closed. I had a friend at the moment who's gone to Ethiopia. You may know the Ethiopians believe that Enoch and Jubilees are Bible. You, you know that, right? And, but the thing is, with these Eastern churches, it's pretty easy to 
from there one day, so I said, would you talk to the highest authority possible, and would you try and get them to give you a list of their canons? Um, you'll find that in some of these eastern places, but as far as I know, the canons are all closed, and uh, they won't be opened again. Perhaps one more question, and then we'll have other questions uh, at the end. Yes. This really doesn't have anything to do with the presentation of the paper. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. I was just wondering if there's any explanation of why the Dead Sea Scrolls were found where they were found in the caves. Why they were found in the caves. Well, one thing is, uh, this is one of the few places in the world where it's dry enough to, to preserve manuscripts. Egypt and Qumran. If they had been, there may have been others in other places, like Europe and Canada or whatever, but they'd all be perished. So it was dry enough, and uh, it depends on your point of view. This could just be an accident. I think Jews and Christians, there may be sort of a religious destiny that it, this is something special for our time. You know, Jews see it as a wonderful gift for, for, for the Jewish people, a symbol of Israel, and Christians are, you know, see this as a wonderful new light into, into the Christian origins. And scholars, of course, revel in this. What were the um, museums for years ago? That that's where they placed um, them? This was a library, and some would say it was also a, um, a Geniza, a, a library of where they stored the, the, the materials, a place where they discarded used ones, or, probably, or possibly when the Romans were attacking, they shoved them in there to keep them safe. So there are different theories on that. Thank you very much.